Maybe. Is it? I think you're going to see that. Yeah. Up there? Yeah. Pledge of Allegiance? Yeah, we should get up and just get up and start reciting. Get up and do it. system that goes with it. 
And the education system in many ways mirrors and is a window into the social system. But if you think about it, schools in places as wildly diverse as um, apartheid South Africa, medieval Saudi Arabia, Soviet Russia, fascist Italy, all of these school systems wanted their kids to stay away from drugs and alcohol. All of them wanted their kids to show up on time, do their homework, and learn their subject matter. All of them wanted their kids to become good citizens in their society. So what makes our, we want that too, instead. But what makes education in a democracy different? What is the one or two things that make education in a democracy different than education in an authoritarian or autocratic uh, system? And I would argue that the basic difference comes down to this, that in a democracy, we take as an article of faith that all human beings are of incalculable value. Every human being is valuable. We also take it as an article of faith in a democracy that um, the fullest development of all is the condition for the fullest development of each. And conversely, the fullest development of each is the condition for the full development of all. That means that has huge implications for policy, but it also has implications for curriculum and teaching. And I, I'm saying this pointedly to teachers because even though um, there's, there's work to do on the policy front and, and the legislature and administration, if you have in your heart as a teacher these fundamental values, I think that you can make a difference in your classroom today, tomorrow, the next day, regardless of whether the state legislature gets it right or the administration gets it right. So what are the implications of this notion of every child, every human being, <clears throat> including every child, is of incalculable value? Well, the policy implications include that we can't tolerate in a democracy a school system in which some kids go to school and get into go to schools where the basic um, situation is that the system spends $40,000 per kid per year to educate them. And other kids, just four or five miles down the road, go to schools that spend $5,000 per kid per year to educate them. That makes a huge difference in terms of the outcomes that those kids are likely to have. It makes a huge difference. And we should be intolerant of that kind of disparity. That's a disparity that's obvious everywhere you go in this country. It's obvious in Chicago. It's obvious in New Jersey. It's obvious in, in New York City. It's obvious in Los Angeles. If, so, if this is what Jonathan Kozol 15, 20 years ago called savage inequalities. The savage inequalities in education are intolerable in a democracy if we take seriously the notion that all human beings are of incalculable value. What we're saying to kids, if we say in Chicago, for example, that some kids go to school at $40,000 per year and some at five, what we're saying to kids is that the, our basic policy towards children is choose the right parents. If you choose the right parents, you'll do fine. But choose the wrong parents, I'm just sorry, you're on your own. That is not a reasonable kind of policy in a democracy. And you know, another way of saying the same thing is in a democracy, whatever the wisest and most privileged parents want for their children, we as a community should want for all of our children. So, and, and that seems to me just basic, simple fairness. So, you remember that when the, the, the president moved, the new president moved from Chicago to Washington, there was great speculation about where he'd send his kids. Well, in Chicago, he, his kids went to the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools. They, what did they find at the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools? They found small classes capped at 15. They found um, a teaching core that was not only well respected, but unionized. They found a curriculum based, at least in part, on following their own interests and asking their own questions of the world and pursuing those questions. They found well-resourced classrooms. So when they went to DC, what do you think happened? There's good speculation. Where will they go to school? Well, they landed at Sidwell Friends, where they found classes that were small, capped at 15, a teacher corps that was, that was um, that was well-respected, widely, uh, you know, highly resourced classrooms, and so on. So if, it, if that's good enough for the children of the President of the United States, shouldn't that be our baseline for saying this is what we want for all of our kids? Not that we could achieve it tomorrow, but isn't it a reasonable aspiration 
Incidentally, Arnie Duncan, the superintendent, the, uh, superintendent of Chicago schools, but now the secretary of education, went to the lab schools for 12 years. So, so this is the education they got. And yet, on the west side of Chicago, second grades are as big as 35 kids per classroom. Does that make a difference in terms of education? It absolutely makes a difference. So on the policy level, we should be fighting for the idea that if all human beings and all children are of incalculable value, we should have a standard that says everybody should be trying to achieve this. Small classes, well-resourced classrooms, a curriculum based in part on pursuing questions, a teacher core that's respected and unionized, teachers who are well-paid, you know, um, well-rested. These are not unreasonable things to expect. And, and these are things we should talk about. But then on the question of curriculum, too, the, question, the, the, the basic assumption of a democracy asks something specific about curriculum. Because in the other social systems that I mentioned, in medieval Saudi Arabia and apartheid South Africa and so on, those curricula, whatever else they taught, they taught obedience and conformity. Whatever else they taught, they taught obedience and conformity. So along with your literature, your music, your math, you've got a big dose of just stay quiet, <coughs> go along, and conform. In a democracy, at least aspirationally, at least um, you know, theoretically, we would want, along with everything else we teach, we would want to say that our kids are learning imagination, curiosity, courage, initiative. These are the kinds of qualities that we would want our kids to graduate with. Why? Because in a democracy, we are the sovereign. We, the people, are the sovereign. We have to make the decisions that affect our lives. The fact that that's imperfect and it doesn't happen in the way that it ought to is worth a lot of discussion. But nevertheless, again, theoretically, in a democracy, we would say the values of initiative and courage and imagination are much, much more powerful and important than the values of obedience and conformity. So to me, this means that you as teachers and all of us as, as concerned citizens ought to be thinking about a couple of things that ought to be part of our, of our classrooms, no matter, again, no matter what else we teach. One, thing that I, one lesson that I think we should learn for ourselves and teach our kids is really simple to say and hard to do, and that is we are all works in progress. We are all on the move. We are all living in a dynamic world. None of us is standing still. And as a work in progress, you have a responsibility. I'm saying you as a teacher, but you as teachers have a responsibility to give your kids a sense that their job is to live a big life, an imaginative life, an aesthetically beautiful life, and a life that isn't con controlled or, or um, contained by dogma or, or uh, any kind of ideological straitjacket, but rather a life that's always seeking, always questions, to ask the next question and the next. And that means that we take as, as a article of, of kind of faith that we are incomplete, that every one of us is incomplete, that we are moving, but that we are not there. And that means that we have to constantly be in a situation of invention and reinvention, and school is a good place to allow that to happen and to learn that powerful lesson. Another very important question that, that we ought to take on to ourselves and also teach our kids is that, uh-oh, Notice he approached and nobody had to get in his way. No security. No security. I think it's worth it. I think it's fine. It's good. It takes a technician to pull the mic. I couldn't figure that out. Thank you so much. Um, a second, besides the notion that we are each a, a work in progress, is the notion that we're living in a, a history that's also um, on the move. That history is not only not finished, but it's being made right in front of us. And if you take a short look backwards, any, anywhere, you recognize that we are that, that we are not at the end of anything, even though existentially it sometimes feels like this is everything that happened led inevitably to this, but it couldn't be true. 
And what that means is that what we do or don't do makes a huge difference, whether we act or don't act, whether we stay quiet or speak up, makes a huge difference. And all of our students, and we ourselves, should learn the lesson that being neutral in a living history is to support the status quo. And it's our responsibility to speak up and speak out on the issues of the day, on the, on the kind of imaginings that we can have about the kind of society we'd like to live in. Now, Americans, as you may know, are known the world around as being both geographically challenged and, and historically, you know, kind of backward. You know that, right? Like, like um, I was telling right. folks earlier. Speak for yourself. I'm sorry. Speak for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but, but here, I'll speak to you as well. Um, you know, National Geographic did a survey of 18 to 25 year old American kids, gave them a blank world map. 80% of American kids couldn't find Iraq on a map. 80% couldn't find Israel Palestine. 40% couldn't find Great Britain. 40% couldn't, exactly. couldn't find Great Britain. And an astonishing 10% couldn't find the United States. That always, I'm sorry. That's my point. That's exactly my point. What are they going to do? But since, since, we, since we all laughed, it's about being a Draw a freehand sketch quickly of Bahrain. Quickly. A freehand sketch of Bahrain. There's American money tied up in it. How about drawing a freehand sketch of uh, Tunis? You know, war and revolution is God's way of teaching Americans geography, so we all now know where Egypt is. But I'll bet you two months ago you couldn't have picked those and barked out of police line. And that's an indication of the fact that we are living isolated lives, and that's a mistake. So one of the things we should recognize is that we live in a world, and that that world is moving and changing constantly. And I think that this is, it's absolutely a criticism of the schools to say that we stopped teaching geography 40 years ago. We stopped teaching history 20 years ago. Now we teach social studies, and even that has become watery and strange. So this is absolutely a problem. And what's the, what's the solution? The solution is teachers have to be smarter themselves about the fact that we are living in time and place and that we are moving in time and place. Um, <clears throat> linked to that is the notion that we are existing in a dynamic and three-dimensional world, and you can only know the world by acting upon it. You can't know the world by sitting back and looking at it. You have to know the world by acting upon it. In simple things, you can't explain ice cream without tasting it. You can't know jazz without hearing it. All of you know how to ride a bicycle, right? And if you're riding a bicycle and you start to fall over to the left, which way do you turn the wheel? Whoops. Which to way? The right. Left. Yeah. To the right. Right, left, exactly. Well, the, the, you turn to the left, but I'm teaching my granddaughter how to ride her bike right now. It's backbreaking work. And uh, the one thing that is for sure true is that I, explaining to her that she's sitting on a gyroscope and that that means that when she falls to the left, she should turn to the left is insane. It doesn't work. But learning how to ride a bike, you automatically learn. You do learn that when you're, that you're on a gyroscope, and you learn that when you're falling to the left, you turn to the left. The same is true in much more abstract and difficult matters. Rather than teaching about history, we should be learning from history. Rather than learning about democracy, we should learn from democracy. Rather than learning about nature, we should be learning from nature. And this is something, again, that you can do in your classrooms. On every important issue, the key thing is to learn from and not about, to not see things as distant and abstract. A final lesson that I think all of us have to enact in our teaching and that we should both enact for ourselves and also for our students is the notion that everything that exists has alternatives, that there is always an alternative. And that means that standing right next to the world as such is the world as it could be or the world as it should be. And those are things that kids can learn to experiment with, to explore, to wonder about. Uh, it, and I'm saying this in direct opposition to Margaret Thatcher's deathless phrase, there is no alternative. There's always an alternative. And seeing the world as possibility is as important as seeing the world as it is. 
What this means to me is that we as teachers, our students as students, and all of us as citizens have to learn a, a rhythm that's extremely simple to say but difficult to do. And that is we have to learn to open our eyes to the world as it is. And open our eyes not just once, but twice, three times, forever. Every day, the exercise of opening your eyes and seeing the world as it really is, is part of learning how to be an active citizen. Secondly, we have to act on whatever the known demands, whatever we see, whatever we understand. We have to act, we have to speak up, we have to say something about it. And then third, we have to doubt. If we don't doubt, we find ourselves in prison in the logic of, a, of, a, of, a, um, of one clear idea, but that idea turns into dogma very, very quickly. So the rhythm is pay attention, be astonished, and then tell about it, doubt, and start over. Um, if you don't doubt, I'm going to just say one word about doubt. Um, if you don't doubt, then you end up, as I said, kind of in a, in a dogmatic world, in a prison. Um, some of you know, for example, the, um, uh, the Life of Brian, the Monty Python movie, do you know that? If you don't, put it on your Netflix immediately. Uh, it's about a reluctant messiah, and he's standing on a rampart at one point during the movie, and he's saying to the mob below, I'm not the Messiah. And they all say to him, you're not the Messiah. And he says, no, 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 you have minds of your own. And they all say, we have minds of our own. And then one guy in the crowd says, it's funny, I don't feel like I have a mind of my own. And the other people smack him and say, shut up, you have a mind of your own. <laughs> well, that's dogma. And that's, that, that passes for thought. But that's very much what we get stuck in if we don't practice the, the, the work of doubting. Paying attention is also much more complicated than it sounds. And there are lots and lots of examples. There's a marvelous book by Jose Saramago, the Portuguese Nobel laureate, called Blindness. It's his first book translated into English. He won the Nobel about eight years ago. You know the book? Hard thing to read because he has no punctuation or paragraphs. That's crazy. But it's a great book. Um, and it was made into a movie with Susan Sontag, I think. Not Susan Sontag. Um, Susan Sarandon. Yeah. Um, but in this book, it opens with, um, it's called Blindness, and his name is Jose Saramago. And you can just Google Blindness and you'll find it. A lot of people can say you can just Google whatever, but anyway, it's just kind of. Um, the book opens, the first paragraph, uh, 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 it's a, some modern American city, and a guy is stuck in traffic during rush hour, and suddenly goes blind at a stoplight. And he can't move, and the car is stuck, and horns honk, and a little chaos breaks out. Someone helps him from his car, and somebody else steals his car. He's taken to a clinic where everyone in the clinic has gone blind. And so they put these folks in a, in, in a locked facility, and they are guarded by, by military so that they can be kind of quarantined. And slowly, the soldiers go blind, and then within the first 30 pages, everyone goes blind. And what do they do in their blindness? What they do is they group up into gangs, and the strong gangs prey on the weak gangs. Gangs of men steal and break gangs from gangs of women. Um, people hoard food and hoard housing. And it becomes a gruesome, miserable, dystopic nightmare um, of huge proportions. And by the time it reaches the kind of very bottom of, uh, of where you can imagine it's going to go, the first guy's eyes come back on. He can suddenly see and then the next, and the next, and then they all can see. And they hug each other, but awkwardly, because what they've done to each other is gruesome and miserable. But they're happy to have their eyesight back, and one person cries out, why did we, why did we, lose, why, why did we lose our sight, and why can we now suddenly see? And someone else says, perhaps we didn't lose our sight, perhaps, perhaps we were always blind. Blind people who could see, seeing people who were blind. And Saramago means that to be a metaphor for our times. We are seeing people who are blind. We are blind people who can see. We're not, we're not unaware of unjust wars and ridiculous kind of over-reliance uh, over on militarization and incarceration and surveillance. We're not unaware of these, but what are we doing? We're not unaware of the AIDS crisis in Africa, but what are we doing about it? And the, the, the demand to wake up, to pay attention, is a demand that, um, that we should take seriously. So to me, that's, that's the rhythm of what we should be practicing. Um, 
are teachers activists? Not always, but I think that we have we share certain things with activists. And one <coughs> is that we practice this rhythm of paying attention, telling about it, and then doubting if we have it right and going back to the beginning. You know, the, the town crier in the in the old days always came through the town saying, all's well. And it's our responsibility to point out where things are not well and to challenge the status quo when it's not acceptable. To ask ourselves, is this the best we can do? And to posit alternatives. So it seems to me that's where it comes together, this notion of democracy, a notion of social justice, and a notion of teaching. Thanks very much. <laughs>
good in the interest of privatization. And, and I think privatizing the public schools is a major, unbelievable mistake. The public schools, and incidentally, the public schools in places like Winnetka and, and Scarsdale are doing just fine, and nobody objects to them. Those are public schools paid for by public money. And I think that there are certain things, and maybe some of the Tea Party folks in the room disagree, but I think certain things are a public good and ought to be paid for by public money. And I'll give you a couple of examples. I think it's good that we have a public fire department in Chicago. I think it's great. Why? Because we used to have a private fire department, you know, in, in the days of Ben Franklin before he invented um, the, 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 the fire department that we know kind of today. And then what happened then is your house caught on fire, gangs of men would call, show up and you would bid with them. If you put out my fire, I'll pay you so much. I think that's a mistake. I think we should actually have a public fire department. Can I get an amen from anybody? <laughs> public fire department. Okay. So I think you should pick up the garbage as a public good. Why? Because where I live in Hyde Park, I actually don't want my next door neighbor to decide, screw it, I'll fill my backyard with garbage. What am I going to do? Train his rats to stay in his yard? No. We have to actually have a shared understanding that the garbage ought to be picked up. And that's something we can come together and talk about. Here's the interesting thing. When I hear some of this argument, I hear you saying, I, I, and I may be wrong, but I hear you saying, there's nothing that the private can't do better than public. I couldn't disagree more. There isn't the government on earth. Every government you know has, has one function, and it's to tax and spend. That's all they do. But they you tax say and they spend. Tax who and tax who and spend on what? Hold tax on, let it finish. You when, let it finish. Get to you. Why, why do you want to interrupt? I, I, in what sense? Because you said you at the beginning you said we're like the worst educated, and now you're saying that we should all go to public schools. Well, I didn't we say we're the worst schools. educated. You're, 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 yeah, well, well, what was the national? That's what I thought I heard you say. Yeah. 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 That's what you were saying to me. Hold on. Well, Mr. Mayor, that's kind of a straw man argument. The, the point I'm making is, I don't, I'm not defending the status quo in education, but I am saying that it is, I am saying that there are certain things, let's just stay with this, there are every government you know taxes and spends, so you may style yourself against big government. So I hope you agree with me that we ought to cut the Pentagon down to zero. That's a trillion dollars, right? No, but we should cut the government that's spending us into exactly. oblivion. So the question is, what do you, who do you want to tax? And what do you want to spend on? I want to tax the rich and spend on the public good. Oh, yeah. Other that never works. Works. What happened? Well, no. Oh, come on. It was a disaster. Mr. Ayers, he, he closed down the voucher schools in Washington. He closed them down. And if you're so hot about the, uh, the charter schools, I hope you take seriously this actual research that's going on that says the charter schools don't actually do better. I didn't say charters. And since they don't do better, why are we, why are we so sold on the fact that that's the way to go? A quick word on unionization. The reason I mentioned unions is I said that's where the Obama kids went to school. I didn't say anything more than that, but now that you've asked, I will say more than that. Good working conditions are good teaching conditions, and good teaching conditions are good learning conditions. You negotiate with teachers and administrators. You have this, the, the legislatures can weigh in. But the idea that you would figure out what good working conditions are without the voice of the teachers is nuts. So in Ohio, in the current kind of round of Tahrir Square in Wisconsin and Ohio, in Ohio, 
the most eloquent spokespeople about unionization were the firefighters. And what did they say? We don't want people telling us how many people can go into a fire of a certain type. We don't want people telling us what gear we can wear and not wear without us being a part of that discussion. The police in Ohio are the same thing. Why should we not be part of the discussion? Good working conditions are good policing conditions, are good public safety conditions. Why wouldn't you have the police in that discussion? The same with teachers. Teachers have a right to organize, they have a responsibility to speak up for kids, and the idea that somehow the problem in America is lazy and competent teachers, people are out of their minds. But here's the problem. The right wing, including the Obama and Duncan administration, has framed the issue this way. Every time during the 2008 campaign, a politician got to the microphone and said, we need to get the lazy, incompetent teachers out of the classroom. Didn't you feel yourself nodding? Some of you vigorously, some of us dully. What am I going to do, stand up and say, that lazy, incompetent teacher has to stay there so my granddaughter can have her? No, you win the argument simply by saying it that way. If I got to the microphone before John McCain and said, every, kid, uh, every school child in America deserves a, a, a competent, intellectually grounded, morally committed, compassionate, caring, well-paid and well-rested teacher in the classroom, wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah. So who gets to frame the issue? And I think it's a mistake that we cede that territory to people who know nothing about education. And the idea that even in a system like Chicago, the idea that the problem is the lazy and competent teachers is an absolute myth. There are people who want to leave. There are people who are incompetent. There's no doubt about it. As there are at IBM and AT&T and a lot of other places. But the idea that that's the core issue is crazy. And what we see in America is a, a disparity that is so unacceptable. And to say that if the problem is that if the teacher were more committed, even though there's less spent on those kids, even though they're, they're living in crumbling buildings, even though they have textbooks that, you know, that go back three decades, it, it's just a, a, a huge mistake. But huge you're not mistake. answering the question yeah, about New Jersey. What, what I asked you about New Jersey. Oh, excuse me. One, one at a time. time. I know you all want to shout. You've already spoken. Yes, sir. One at a time. Don't you believe that if um, teachers knew that they could be fired as opposed to having the union say them, don't you, tenure, don't you believe that they might be a little bit better teacher? Absolutely not. And why not? The I mean, is, and I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you why. Yeah, well, there are a lot of teachers in this room, so we can speak to it. But the idea, as, as you know, the idea that people go into teaching, they, did any of you go into teaching thinking you were going to get rich? <laughs> okay, I don't have to go all the way back to the Let beginning. Me. Why the hell did these schools go into teaching? What were they thinking? They, no. You're not going to get rich, folks. If you want to and not only are you not going to get rich, you're not going to get any respect. And not only did you not get any respect, my son, a tenured teacher in Oakland, California, with a great record, just got his third pink slip in a row because of the budget crisis in California. Now, we can fire Tomahawk missiles in Libya, and we're going to fire teachers at the same time. What the hell is wrong with that? I'm not afraid of Libya. 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 Mr. Ayers. <laughs> and we can't afford teachers in the classrooms. That is crazy, and it's an absolute recipe for disaster. The average teacher in the city schools, the average teacher stays three to four years. That's a recipe for disaster in the long run. We ought to invest more in teaching. We ought to invest in smaller classes, exactly as the Obama kids have. That should be our standard for what all kids should have. Fifteen kids in a classroom and so on. You've already spoken. Yes, ma'am. That's full class school, though, is it not? Say, say again. That's school they're attending. Is that not private? The, yeah, that's a private school, exactly. Okay. Well, okay. What's the matter it's a good standard, school, though, isn't it, for a democracy to say what the wisest and, and most privileged have, we ought to aspire for that for all of our kids. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'll defer the second if you don't want me to ask. The first one is this. Uh, this comes from both the Bush administration and the Obama administration, No Child Left Behind. It's a huge bureaucracy that takes away the creativity from teaching, from what many teachers think. And that in addition to that, because I, I do know Paul Torrance, I've studied creativity, and I do agree with you completely that our children, although they should learn grammar and rhetoric and logic, 
that they are missing on the creative portion, but the No Child Left Behind just sucks the creativity out of a teacher's daily day. In addition to that, it comes out of a $100 billion Department of Education, Washington, D.C. Now, how about we close that department down and let our states do some phenomenal exactly. work? So I, you know, I think that, they, that, that, that the Duncan Obama administration on education is a catastrophe. Race to the top has all the weaknesses of No Child Left Behind with some new ones thrown in of, of its own. The very idea that a race to the top is based on the idea that education, and this is another part of the framing of this argument that's so destructive. Education has been framed successfully in the last two decades as a product like a bathtub or a toilet that you would buy in the market. If education is a product like that, then Michelle Reed, the superintendent of the DC schools for a while, makes perfect sense. The, the puff piece in Time Magazine that talked about Michelle Reed and said she's done more to reform the DC schools in a year and a half than most reformers have done in five, colon. She's closed 30 schools, she's fired 45 principals, she's fired 300 central office staff, and 150 teachers, period. That makes sense if you're running something like Enron, then you're privatizing and, and all that. But since education is not a product, but rather is a process and a human right, then it seems to me that that whole notion of education um, as, a, as a product is backwards and destructive. So I would argue that yes, No Child Left Behind is a disaster, Race to the Top is a disaster. But here's what I want to say about Race to the Top. The very idea, if you listen to the President's last State of the Union address when he talked about, about, about um, education, he sounded like the program officer from a foundation, not like the President of the United States. The President of the United States is concerned with all kids, not giving out grants to those who can conform to some kind of measure that they created. So I think it's a catastrophe, but more than that, if you say race to the top, you're saying a couple of things. You're saying New Jersey compete against New York. And one of you is going to lose. More of you are going to lose than are going to win. And really educate. Yes, indeed. That's exactly what race to the top race is to top. Okay. Yes. And not only that, but the idea that we were in competition with each other and that's going to make us better, again, is based on this metaphor of the product. But what it means is Chicago's competing against Springfield. And in Chicago, my school is competing against your school. And in the third grade, I, my third grade, I'm a third grade teacher competing against her. And frankly, I don't want you to know anything about what I'm doing because I might lose in that competition. What does it lead to? An obsession with standardized testing, which is a mistake. It, it, standardized testing it begins to stand for education, which is not, it, which it can't. It narrows the curriculum so that only people, only children who have parents who can afford the best schools are getting art, music, physical education, science, uh, history, language, anything like that. The rest of the kids, they're in a grind around learning how to take the tests on math and science. So there was a dismal story in the New York Times last year, a picture of a little African American girl standing on a fence at a farm, looking over into a pig pen, you might remember, it was the front page. And the headline was, trip to the farm may improve test scores. And you say, really? So if the trip to the farm doesn't improve the test scores, no farm for you. You think anybody who has the privilege of living in, in Shaker Heights or Lake Forest is going to say to their kid, you know what? I can't give you the piano lesson. I can't give you the arts. I can't give you the trip to the farm because it's not going to improve your test scores. That's what we're doing in, in this race to the top. We're competing and we're narrowing the curriculum around a very suspect measure of what it means to be either intelligent or successful. By saying that, that there is no purpose in the federal Department of Education, I, Look, it sounds like it to me. I, I'm not, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a big stake in either the federal Department of Education or the states. The thing I, I don't particularly agree with with you on is, you know, give the money to the states, is I don't have a great confidence in the states either. You have confidence in the state of Illinois? They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to collect their taxes or the parking meters. Yeah. And, and certainly they don't know how to run 
I, I love the headline this week in The Onion about the Japanese nuclear crisis. They said, American nuclear industry assures us that all of our nuclear plants are safe unless an unforeseen event happens. Exactly. <laughs> so I don't trust the nuclear power industry, I don't trust the states, and I don't trust the federal government. So it's a, you know, we can go over the fine points of how to spend it, but what I do believe is that as a community, as a community in this wildly diverse, weird democracy of ours, we have a responsibility to educate all of our children up to the standard of what the most privileged and, you know, Never most happened. powerful have. Never yes? You didn't answer the communist question. Oh, the communist question. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, these labels are all suspect, but I'll say this. Um, I'm, a, I'm a First Amendment, I'm a fundamentalist. I'm the death penalty, I'm an abolitionist. I'm um, the economy, I'm a socialist, and I'm government, I'm an anarchist. So does that help? Yes. Okay. So why are you here? Yes. <laughs> Do any of you know yes. what it was that he just said? You're all clapping. Yeah. 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 I think some of you were there for some of the government that also makes money, aren't you? I mean, some of you are definitely libertarians, aren't you? Yeah. We, we want to. I, 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 I hold, 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 hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it, hold it. Go ahead. Yes. Yep. Hold it. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
because that's the policy in Chicago. Now he's got three different schools, three different teachers, and he's missed 40 days of school. How do you think he's going to do on a test score? Not very well. And in the richest country in the world, that's an abomination. And again, it comes back to, do you really believe that that kid should have picked you for a parent and then would have done better? Do you take these kids away from those incompetent, lazy parents and give them to you? Do you want to raise them? I mean, it's ridiculous, but it's true. It's ridiculous to kind of blame everything on, on the schools yeah, or the teachers. Don't worry. That, I but I still think the schools can do a better job. How can we do a better job? Schools have to be smaller. Classrooms have to be smaller. And this is actually budget neutral to some degree. Schools have to be smaller. Classrooms have to be smaller. Every kid has more. to be known well by a caring adult. Every parent has to feel access to the school. I'm going to give you one more shot. You don't agree. I can see you growing up. My Bad words. 